Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala Alhamdulillah today is the 42nd uh, part of the seerah Nabawiyah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this is actually the part uh, part 6 of Isra wa al-Mi'raj so we've been talking about Isra wa al-Mi'raj for the past 5 weeks and we're going to be going on to part 6 today inshallah so last week we talked about how the Prophet sallallahu uh, he rose to the 7th heaven with Jibreel alayhi sallallahu salam and then he saw different uh, things in Jannah itself. So he went into Jannah in his physical form and he went into the uh, Jannah and he saw the different uh, parts of Jannah. He saw Kothar, he saw different things in Jannah. And uh, we talked about how the Prophet ﷺ, uh, saw uh, Kothar itself and I talked about Kothar itself, how it's going to be on the Day of Judgment. It's going to be there for us to drink from. And the Prophet ﷺ himself will give us to drink from his blessed hands, inshallah. And uh, if just one question, inshallah, and then I'll go on. But uh, you guys remember who are those people who will um, will be rejected the Kothar on the Day of Judgment? So I talked about how the Prophet ﷺ will see people; they will be coming close, and then the angels will bar them from coming closer and drinking from Kothar. Who are those people? Which the Prophet says, some says, says sorry? Uh, well, no, not hypocrites. So those who added to the deen, okay? Those who changed the religion, okay? They went, they went and they changed the religion. So the Prophet says, will say that these people are from my ummah. What are you doing? Why are you stopping them from coming forward? And the angels will respond, you don't know what they did after you. So Allah protects us all, inshallah. So here, uh, Sadat al-Muntaha is the last, uh, sorry, the, um, yeah, the last part of, of uh, where the creation, any creation can go. And Sadat al-Muntaha, this is basically the lotus tree. And now the ulama have talked about different things in depth of why the lotus tree, why not some other tree. Uh, there's a lot of th- different reasons, but the thing is, at, again, at the end, Allah SWT chose the lotus t- tree, and that's it, that's the reason. So the lowest tree is at the furthest part above the seven heavens. Uh, uh, I mean, it's in the seventh heaven, but it's above the other heavens. And it's the, basically the highest point. Now, one of the things the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam describing Siddhat al-Muntaha, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, رُفِعَتْ إِلَيَّ سِذَرَةُ الْمُنْتَهَا So then I saw Siddhat al-Muntaha, it, was, it came before me. And he says, فَإِذَا نَبْقُهَا مِثْلُ قِلَالِ حَجْرِ That the, the, the fruits of this tree were like the jugs of Hajar. So Qilal Hajar, this is a, some type of jug and uh, it's the size of that jug basically. That's how big the, the fruits were of that tree, of the lotus tree. وَإِذَا وَرَقُهَا مِثْلُ آذَانِ فِيَالَ The Prophet says that they're the, uh, the leaves, the waraquha, the leaves of this tree were like the, the ears of elephants. So this is how the Prophet saw this and then he says, قَالْ هَذِهِ سِدْرَةُ الْمُنْتَهَا Ijabi Ali Sam said that this is سِدْرَةُ الْمُنْتَهَا Now, one of the things about the Sidr tree is it's actually used uh, uh, for healing purposes. So for example, the leaves can be used uh, if you boil it. Uh, it helps against sihr that has been swallowed. So if, you, if, you, if someone swallows mag, uh, you know, sihr and uh, Jadu, Sihr, black magic. If you if you swallow something like that, then that those leaves are used and uh, that can basically take out that Sihr. Uh, also, it's used for bathing the dead. It has a, a like a smell to it, a nice smell to it. So it's used for that. Uh, one of the things the Prophet saw below this tree, Sadat al Muntaha, he saw two hidden rivers and he saw two apparent ones, Zahiran wa Batinan. So two Zahiran, the ones that were apparent, and two that were hidden. And he asked Jibreel alayhi what is this? And Jibreel alayhi uh, responds by saying that these are the ones that are Zahiran, those are, that are apparent. These, this is the Nile, the Nile River, and the Euphrates River. Okay? And we know that the Nile and the Euphrates, Euphrates rivers are very important actually not only just in the past with all the past that's surrounding that area but also in the future 
For example, we know that there's hadith on the signs of Qiyamah where one of them, uh, this is one of the minor signs of the Day of Judgment. Uh, and again, it doesn't have to, uh, all the minor signs don't have to appear and then the major signs start. But some of the minor signs can wait or can appear after the major signs have started. So one of the minor signs is actually the mountain of gold will appear in the Euphrates River. And this is something the Prophet told us, and he actually warned us against this. He said that when that happens, do not go near it. So people will go, they'll try to go and think, okay, I'll be one of those. So out of 100 people, only 99 will, uh, only one person will survive. So 100 people will go and try to fight for that goal, try to go for the gold. 99 of them will die, only one person will be able to come back, and that, who knows how much they can even carry. So the Prophet warned us not to even try to go near that. Uh, another signs of, of Qiyamah, uh, sign of Qiyamah, I mean, you could say sign of Qiyamah because of local the, the politics. I don't want to really go into politics, but uh, one of the things that appearing, the Prophet in one of the hadith, he talks about, he says, okay, for become, how will you be when uh, Iraq is destroyed? And then how will you be when Syria is destroyed? And how will you be when Egypt, Misr is destroyed? So he said that he's in this exact order. And we see Iraq, basically their economy has been destroyed. Then you have Syria, Sham, uh, not Syria, but Sham, he said. And Sham, we see how the countries there, same thing, is, uh, is, you know, is destroyed basically. And Egypt is on the brink of that. They're actually, you know, their economy is really bad right now. And one of the things about the, the Nile River is that there's a really thing, and they say that this could spark a war actually in, uh, in the area because uh, Ethiopia is building a huge dam on the Nile River and Egypt is against that and there's a lot of political... Anyways, so I'm not going to go into detail but there, there's two things about that. Now, one of the things about the Nile and Euphrates, uh, uh, maybe not physically, but uh, spiritually, maybe there's some kind of connection between, uh, be, behind, you know, underneath the cities of Muntaha and coming to the Euphrates and the Nile. Now, Jibreel was with the Prophet and at this point, this is where he, uh, st he stops and the Prophet continues on. So Rasulullah actually he says that I saw Jibreel, he started going forward, he started rising forward and he looked back, he saw Jibreel in his, uh, his, his normal form, so his, his original form. And there's only two times where the Prophet saw Jibreel in his original form. Number, the first one we talked about, when was that, anybody remember? This was when the Wahi, okay, when the when the Wahi appeared, okay, the uh, Prophet saw him uh, sitting on a kursi, sitting on a on like a throne in the sky, and he said that he was basically covering the the, um, the horizon. In this um, incident in Isra al Mi'raj, the Prophet sees him for a second time, and again he has six hundred wings, so he has the most wings. The angels, some have one, some have two, goes on until 600. Jabir has the most wings. And the Prophet ﷺ describing that he had his wings and it was, he had his wings spread out, and from them were falling, the rubies and emeralds were falling from his wings. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, he says that to Jabir, I say that, why aren't you coming forward? Uh, and Jabir responds by saying that I cannot go forward. And one of the Raya comes. Uh, Imam Tabarani, rahimullah, he says that Jibreel said that in the baini wa baini Allah, that between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are 70 hijab, 70 veils. And if I even go close to one of them, I will burn. I will go, I will basically be destroyed. So Jibreel stops there. The Prophet himself goes on further. And he sees. Uh, Siddhar al Muntaha, one of the things about Siddhar al Muntaha, I, didn't, uh, I think I didn't mention that, but Siddhar al Muntaha, one of the things that happens uh, that there were, the Prophet uh, describes Farash, uh, Farash uh, min Zahab. He saw golden butter, butterflies, golden butterflies around Siddhar al Muntaha. And the Prophet mentions then all of a sudden uh, it changed. So, Ghashiya ma Yamshaha. So, it, something covered it and it changed in those t colors. The Prophet says that no one is able to describe, I am not able to describe the, what I saw. And we see, you know, for example, um, at uh, uh, 
uh, Sherwin Williams, for example, they have 1,500 different colors. Okay, and uh, I'm getting house painted, that's why I know. But the thing is, 1,500 different colors, and you have, for example, uh, the colors itself, the color spect spectrum with the different shades and the lights and stuff. There's actually an infinite number of colors. So Allah alam how many they are, we don't even know the infinite number of colors. And Rasulullah saw this, he said that no one is able to describe the beauty of this, of what he saw. And then the Prophet Sallallahu he says he went on further uh, beyond Sidrat al-Muntaha and he heard the scratching of the pens. The Sarif al-Aqlam, so the, the scratching of a pen, meaning like someone, you know when you're, when you're writing uh, with a pen, that that's sound it makes when you're writing on with a on a paper piece of paper, people don't really write anymore. So that's why people don't even know how that sounds anymore. But the thing is, when you're writing on paper, that sound. So the Prophet system heard this, and these are actually the the pen itself was writing the orders of Allah from the the qadr. Uh, it could have been the qadr. It could have been you know it's something that was being written. And now we know that uh, the Prophet system tells in another hadith that the first of creation, the first of creation, anybody know what's the first of creation? First thing that Allah is one. Okay. I'm sorry? Jibriya Alayhi Salaam? Okay, no, that's a good guess. Anybody else? The Qalam, yes, the Qalam. There's, there's a difference of opinion. Uh, some ulama say it was water, some say it was the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, but others, there's a hadith where it says the qalam, the, the pen, was the first thing that was created. And this was 50,000 years before he created the heavens and the earth. Before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth, 50,000 years before that, and the qalam was ordered to write, and it wrote whatever was to happen up to uh, the day of judgment, or you know, whatever was to happen. So the Prophet heard this, and uh, he, then he goes on further, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's arsh, the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is it's actually right now that we know it's being held up by pillars, okay? And the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has pillars and there are four angels, the hamal, they're called the hamalatul arsh and they are carrying, they're carrying the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these hamalatul arsh, there's actually a rawayat uh, the, where the Prophet describes them. He says that their feet are way down in the seventh earth. They start from the seventh earth and they extend all the way up to the seven heavens. And basically, the the between uh, sorry the be, between the earlobe of one of them and their shoulder is seven hundred years. Now we don't know what those seven hundred years are exactly, but that's the that's how the Prophet describes them. And the Prophet says that these hamalatul arsh. That we uh, actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that these yusabbihuna, uh, they're, they're basically uh, um, remembering Allah, they're, doing tas they're, they're glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's one of the Rabbana du'as, the Rabbana du'as, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in the Quran, there's a du'a that starts with Rabbana. There's about 40 some of those in the Quran. And uh, one of them is this one where the Hamalat al Arsh. They're asking Allah SWT, they're, they're glorifying Allah SWT. They're asking Allah SWT to forgive the believers, those who have believed, those who do good deeds. And they are, uh, so they're basically asking for, for forgiveness uh, for us. And Allah SWT uh, responds to their, their du'as, uh, responds to their du'as and accepts their du'as for us. Now those Hamlet al-Arsh, right now there's four of them. Uh, but on the day of judgment, they, it will increase to eight. The the number will increase to eight. Now, the arsh of Allah SWT itself, we don't we know that uh, there's another ayah where the Prophet SAW tells us that the the distance between the first heaven and the second heaven, there's 500 years distance between that heaven, then the second heaven between the second and the third, then the third and fourth, and going and so forth. Then you have the Arsh of Allah, uh, sorry, you have the, the seventh heaven and the Kursi. Okay, the Arsh, the throne of Allah, and the Kursi. Kursi is something different. Uh, kursi, you know, we, we translate as, as a chair. Okay, that's one of the translations. But the ulama translate as a footstool. Okay, 
Now, one of the things is that, you know, in our minds, we should not ever think, okay, a footstool and a throne, you know, billah, it's not something that Allah SWT needs or He doesn't even need this creation. But well, Allah SWT created it and He, he owns the, the throne he, and He rose above the throne. Allah SWT is above the throne. So He does not need it. He does not use it. Okay, Allah SWT is above it. So um, uh, the kursi is there and then between the kursi and the arsh of Allah SWT is 500 years and then there's water. There's water actually underneath the throne. The throne of Allah SWT is upon a layer of water. Now, <clears throat> one of the things we know that Shaitan, the Prophet ﷺ tells us about Shaitan in a Sahih Hadith, uh, Imam Muslim Rahimullah narrates his Hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ says, "In the Iblis yada'u arshahu ala al So Shaitan is trying to copy Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He has a throne and he has put it on water. We don't know where it is. Some say Bermuda Triangle, whatever. But the thing, wherever it is, the Shaitan has this this arsh. He has a throne and he has put it on water. And then uh, the Prophet ﷺ describes that, uh, that he sends out the different shayateen in the world. So these shayateen go out in the world and they cause fitna, they cause trouble, they do waswasa, they do whatever they do. And then he gathers them all in the evening and he asks them, what did you do? So one of them says, okay, I caused this person to do this sin. I caused this person to do zina. I caused this person to uh, go on some bad website or something like that. I caused this person to curse. I caused this person to th- uh, st- steal something. Okay, so he says, okay, good, you did, you know, you did good and you know, sit down. Then one of them, one of the shayateen stands up and he says, I caused a husband and wife to fight. I caused a husband and wife to fight. Now the shaitan, he tells him, he goes, come closer. He comes closer. And it's not to smack him or anything like that, but he, he tells him, come closer. And he says to him, he actually gets up from his arch, from his throne, and he, he hugs this shaitan, and he says to him, you're the man. You did the right thing. You did something very good today. So he basically tells him, shabash, you know, you did so good today that you caused the fight between husband and wife. Remember, when, when there's harmony in the family, when there's harmony in the home, then a person can do ibadah, can do other things. But when there's fighting going on and that kind of stuff going on, a person is distracted from everything. It's, it's, it's not, a person not able to function correctly and is not able. So the shaitan is trying to break up the root level of the family structure. And that's why he's so happy when the shaitan comes back and says this. Now, one of the things also we know that the souls of martyrs, the shuhada, those who are martyrs, that their souls are flying in Jannah and they, there's, um, I don't know how to explain, but some type of hanging, something hanging from the Arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where these birds, they settle upon, they sit upon the, the, the Arsh, basically hanging underneath the Arsh of Allah and they sit on this. Uh, that's the souls of the martyrs until the Day of Judgment. Now, one of the things about the Prophet sallallahu he tells us that the shade of Allah on the Day of Judgment. So we know that on the Day of Judgment, the sun will be a meal. And meal, the ulama interpret as either one mile or one basic like, you know, like one meal is like the thing that you use, the surma stick that you use to put surma in your eyes. They say like that. So it's going to be very close and everyone will be sweating different levels according to their sins and it will be burning, it will be, it will be hot on that day. But there will be people who will be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah make us those, uh, amongst those inshallah. So, يَوْمَ لَا ذِلَّ إِلَّا ذِلُّ The day that there will be no shade except the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the shade of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the people will be inshallah and will be amongst them under that shade. Uh, there's different categories, for example, there's a famous hadith where there's seven categories mentioned. The just ruler, okay, uh, a shab, someone who grew up in the ibad of Allah from his childhood up to growing up, he was always doing worship of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Someone who was called by a person of of uh, someone who had beauty and money, and asked them to do zina, and that person out of the fear of Allah rejects that. Someone who cries out of the fear of Allah subhanahu in solitude. Someone who gives sadaqah in such in such secrecy that his uh, his left hand doesn't know what his right hand has given, meaning no one knows how much that person has given. He hides his sadaqah or she hides their sadaqah. So there's different, um, you know, these categories of people, inshallah, 
who I will be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, beyond the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah ascended beyond that. And this is where no one has ever gone, even actually has where no angel or no one else has gone beyond that. The Prophet ascends beyond the throne and uh, Rasulullah he, uh, he has a meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there's a difference of opinion, there's two main opinions. Did he actually see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? And the majority opinion is that he did not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he saw a veil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said the, the, one of the hijabs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, he, and this is uh, actually in the ayah, A'udhu Billahi Ibn Shaitan, Thumma dana fatadalla fakana qaba qawsayni aw adna. That he went forward and he uh, he was, uh, uh, what's it called? He was, fakana qaba qawsayni aw adna. Qawsayni is basically the, the bow. So you know the bow and arrow. So the Qawsain, that's the, the part of the arrow. So he was he was even closer than that. And the ulama say that this is actually talking, referring to Jibreel Ali Salam in his original form. So Rasulullah was close to Jibreel Ali Salam between even uh, like the Qawsain, even the, the bow and arrow, even closer than that. Now, like I said, there's two majority opinions and uh, I'm sorry, two main opinions and even within the Sahaba there's difference of opinion but the majority opinion is that Allah, uh, that Rasulullah SAW did not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but he saw a veil but he did speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly so that is, there's no contest with that uh, Rasulullah SAW did speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly now one of the things that we know is uh, I mean, sorry, one of the things that we don't know is that we don't know of the of the, um, the 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 conversation that just transpired between Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is one of the things the the wisdom maybe there's uh, the hikmah behind this is if Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does not want us to know something, we don't know it. So it's not found in any hadith of what conversation took place between Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but we do know that he spoke to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Now, one thing is about seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know that Musa alayhi salam did ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I want to see you. I want to see, he asked Allah, I want to see you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded by saying, Lan tara, meaning you will not be able to see me. In this dunya, you will not be able to see me. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs him, but look at that mountain. And if it is able to bear the burden, then you will be able to see me. Okay, so Allah SWT sent one of the tajalli, meaning one of the, um, the just the nur from Allah SWT, not even, not even a, just a, you know, part of the nur of Allah SWT that went and descended on that mountain, and the mountain became ashes, it burned to ashes. And uh, Musa alayhi salam actually became unconscious at that point. So we know that we will actually see Allah SWT in Jannah. And there's different rawayat mentioned about this, and it's a beautiful rawayat. There's, uh, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah describes it very beautifully in, in one of his books where the people of Jannah will go into their Jannah, they'll go to their prayer, they'll settle down. So once we go into the doors of Jannah, uh, we'll have like a self GPS guide where automatically we'll know our address, we'll know where exactly we have to go without us to anybody guiding us or telling us where to go and we'll go straight to our homes. After we're in our homes and we're experiencing the pleasures of Jannah, and the food of Jannah, you know, the beauty of Jannah, everything in Jannah, we're, we're, uh, we're um, experiencing the pleasures. At that point, all of a sudden, yunadi uh, munadin. So then a person, uh, a, a caller will call out, meaning one of the angels will call out that, oh, the people of Jannah come forth. So people will leave whatever they're doing. Whatever they're doing at that point, they'll leave that and they'll go and they'll gather at a place and this place, there'll be different levels. So there'll be, for example, manabir min nur. There'll be thrones of nur. There'll be thrones like, you know, made of rubies and emeralds of gold and whatnot. Then like, for example, thrones made of wood, thrones made of cushions, for example, different levels. Some people will be sitting on mounds of sand and some people will be sitting on the ground itself. So different levels of people in Jannah, different levels of people sitting, their sitting arrangements. They will come forth, and then at that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call out and say, is there anything that you want? Is there anything that you can ask for? 
And the people will respond by saying that, Oh Allah, you have forgiven us and you have put us into Jannah. What else is there that we can ask for? There's nothing else that we want. But then Allah SWT will, will remove the hijab and reveal himself and we will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in Jannah. So, <clears throat> so we'll see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran وَلَدَيْنَ mazid, meaning <clears throat> we have all the pleasures in Jannah and then you have the mazid even more than that which is the greatest pleasure of Allah of Jannah is the seeing and the meeting with <clears throat> with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now after the people see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will order them to go back to their Jannah. And they will not want to go. And they'll actually stay behind. They say, no, we don't want to go anywhere. We don't want to go back to our Jannah. We don't want to go back to those pleasures. We want to stay here and just keep on looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and speaking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes in one of the ruayas he will basically kind of, um, I don't want to use the word bribe, but he will offer them something to distract them. And he will offer them, a souk will be put in place, and they will be told to go into that souk and take whatever you want from that souk, and then you can go back and they'll go, they'll go back. And then until the next meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again they'll come back. So this is something that will happen again and again, not just one time in Jannah, but it will be something that will happen again and again in Jannah. Uh, one of the things the, the ulama say, uh, I'm not sure exactly how authentic this is, but they say that uh, according to your level in Jannah, so inshallah if we make it to uh, Jannah for those, for example, with the Prophet Sallallahu then we'll be able to see Allah Subhanahu wa whenever we want. And we're not going to have to wait for that certain day. Another uh, rawaya, I'm not sure exactly again how authentic this is, but they say that uh, you know the different levels of seedings of the people who will see Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So the ones who want to be in the front row, if you want to be close to Allah SWT in the front row, then you have to come to Jum'ah Salah on time. Those who leave their workplace, their jobs, they work, leave their, um, you know, their homes, whatever they're doing, whatever they're busy with, their tijara, they leave that and they go early to the masjid on Fridays, then that person inshallah ta'ala will be in the front row uh, when, when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, one of the things that the Prophet Sallallahu did in the um, hadith of uh, Sahih Muslim, uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radhiallahu anhu tells us a beautiful hadith of three gifts that were given directly by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this Isra wal Mi'raj. So in this uh, hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, one thing to mention: Lama usriya bi Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, unti untuhiya bihi ila so Abdullah bin Masood Radhan in this hadith, in this authentic hadith, he says that the root, or the, uh, sorry, Siddhartha al-Muntaha is in the sixth heaven. So the ulama say, because the other awayas say it's in the seventh heaven, so they say that uh, you can join the two and uh, say that the roots of this, the trunk of this tree is in the sixth heaven and then the branches and the trunk ends in the seventh heaven. So it starts from the sixth heaven and then it goes and ends in the seventh heaven. Uh, Abdullah ibn Masood in this hadith, he says, uh, yantahi ma ya, ma bihi min al -ard. So our salawat, our prayers, our du'as, whatever we do in this world, it's, it raises up. Our du'as, for example, they raise up, they go up and they stop at Sidratul Muntaha, فَيُقْبَضُ minha, And then they are taken up after it. So they basically, the angels bring these deeds up to that, to, that, to that station, the relay station basically. They stop there and then the, the amal and all these du'as go up by themselves. And whatever of the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come, they come and they stop at this relay station and then they are given out, the orders are giving out, given out to the malaika, for example. 
So uh, another thing that Abdullah bin Mas'ud says in this hadith, uh, uh, sorry, it was Yaqul uh, al-Nawi rahmallah. So Imam Nawi rahmallah in his explanation of this hadith, he says, Summiyat Sidrat al-Muntaha, it's called Sidrat al-Muntaha li'anna ilm al-Malaika yantahi ilayha. The ilm, the knowledge of the Malaika stop at Sidrat meaning no one has been, been beyond that point, so no one knows what's beyond that. وَلَمْ يُجَاوِزْهَا أَحَدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. So no one has ever passed Sidrat al-Muntaha except the Prophet Sallallahu And oh yeah, I, I mentioned already, sorry, uh, uh, where Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says إِذْ يَغْشَى أَسِدْرَةَ مَا يَغْشَى So whatever has covered, you know, the golden butterflies, I, co- I talked about that already. And then how it changes to different colors. So I already talked about that. Okay, now the three gifts that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud Radhan mentions for Utiya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thalathan. The Prophet was given three things in this meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. as salawat al khams. He was given the five daily prayers. Wa'atiya khawatim as surat al baqarah. And he was given the last two ayahs of Surah Baqarah. وَغُفِرَ لِمَنْ لَمْ, uh, لِمَنْ لَمْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ أُمَّتِي شَيْئًا الْمُقْحِمَاتِ أَوْ كُمَا قَالَ صَلَى اللَّهِ This is actually the sayings of, uh, saying of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud Radhan. So anyway, so Abdullah ibn Mas'ud Radhan respond, uh, by, he, he explains, he says that the three things that were given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, and I'll, I'll say them in reverse order, but the, you have the promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this promise is that anyone who does even major sins, anyone who does even major sins, they will eventually be forgiven and they will be taken to Jannah. Okay? As long as they don't do shirk. So people who have iman, even an ounce of iman, if they, because of their major sins or other sins that they're doing, if they even have to go to Jahannam for thousands of years, millions of years, Allah Adam, whatever the years, but eventually they will make it to Jannah. The mushrikeen, those who uh, do shirk, those who worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who are not on the deen of Islam, they will not be taken out of the hellfire. Now, that's the first, that's one thing that was given. Another uh, another gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this, on this occasion of Isra wal Mi'raj is that the Prophet gave was given the last two ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah. And this is from where uh, Allah SWT says, آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ رَبِّ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ كُلٌّ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ لَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ مِنْ رُسُلِهِ وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا وَفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ So this is uh, the first ayah and then the second one, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها until the end of the surah. So these are the last two ayat of Surah Baqarah, and it actually comes in the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ tells us, and this is in Sahihain, authentic hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ, and this is actually related by Abdullah bin Mas'ud Radhan, he says that the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ قَرَأَ بِالْآيَتَيْنِ مِنْ آخْرِ سُورَةِ الْبَقَرَةِ فِي لَيْلَةٍ كَفَتَا أَوْ كُمَا قَرَأَ سَيْسَلَمْ That the one who reads this before going to sleep, they read the last two ayahs of Surah Baqarah. So we need to start memorizing this. And if not memorizing, we can take our phones, take out the Quran, the Mus'haf, and read from there. But we should make a habit of this. Read these two ayahs before we sleep and kafata, meaning that these two ayahs will be enough for that person. Now, the ulama have talked about this as what's the meaning of this. So Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says, As-Sahi anna ma'na kafata. Min uh, sharri ma So the the meaning of this is that Allah Subhanahu will protect that person from anything that can harm that person. Meaning that person will be protected throughout the night. It will be protected, and, and not even just through but that person will be protected uh, uh, by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Waqila kafata min layl wa laysa bishay. And he says that some people say that it means that uh, you don't. He uh, he he has the. Uh, he has the reward of the Salat al-Tahajjad and he doesn't need to get up for Salat al-Tahajjad but Laysa Bishay, that means that has uh, no meaning. So meaning that uh, these these two ayat will protect us from any shar, from anything that will harm us. And another hadith, the Prophet, uh, Prophet Shasim tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we make this dua, when we say these two ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds right away and says, Qad fa'alt. 
that I have done it, meaning I have uh, accepted this dua. And then the third gift that was given to the Prophet ﷺ in this, on this occasion was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the obligation of salawat. So we see from all the Qur'an, all the, the whole entire Qur'an was sent down, down with Jibreel through wahi, was sent down to the earth. And the last two ayahs of Surah Baqarah were given to the Prophet ﷺ directly in the, in the heavens. Okay, during the Isra al Mi'raj. And then you have the obligation of prayer. All the five, uh, I mean, sorry, all the four obligations, uh, you know, Saum or Ramadan, Hajj, uh, Zakah, everything else that's far upon us, all the obligations were sent down to the earth. And one was kept because on this special occasion, given to, given to the Prophet by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heavens. And that was the obligation of five prayers. So we know the five prayers. In the beginning, before Isra and Mi'raj, it was actually Nafal. There was Nafal, and they would pray Tahajjud prayer, and they would pray in some way. And then uh, five daily prayers were given to the Prophet ﷺ. Now, one of the things, uh, and inshallah, I'll stop here, and then we'll continue on talking about what happens after the, the Prophet ﷺ comes back from meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that one, one hadith, it's da'if, it's weak, but the Prophet ﷺ says, As-salatu mi'rajul mu'min that the salah is a mi'raj. So we're talking about mi'raj is going, remember ascension, right? So as-salah mi'raj al-mu'min. The salah itself is the ascension of a believer. So anytime we want to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anytime we want to, uh, you know, have our du'as and our uh, words risen up, go rise up to the heavens and speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly, just start praying. We read the ayat of Quran, which are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. We read these in prayer, and when it's a conversation between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know Surah Fatiha, for example, when we recite Surah Fatiha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to us while we're reading Surah Fatiha. So this is uh, Mi'raj al-Mu'min. We should t- keep t- uh, take care of our salawat, not only just the five fara'id, but also the nawafil, that Qiyam al-Layl, Qiyam al-Layl is very important. Qiyam al-Layl, you know, we know that uh, a person, uh, uh, one of the hadith is that the aqrabu ma yakun the al-abd, that one of the closest ways to be to Allah SWT is in, in the Qiyam al-Layl, in the, in the, in the, in the night, the, especially the latter third part of the night. And that's when we're, where Allah SWT uh, descends to the first heaven, and Allah alam bi muradihi, we don't know exactly, but we know it happens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the first heaven and he calls out and he says that who is there to ask and I will give him. And who is there to, uh, to seek repentance, seek forgiveness and I will forgive them. And who is there to, to basically, so basically whoever we ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will respond to us. So we need to you know, have a habit inshallah of praying our daily salawat, our nawafil, our qiyam layl inshallah. And this is a way for us to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq inshallah to be of those who take care of our prayers. Sakla khair. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.